All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Stone. I'm a professor at UAA, and we're here today to talk about the book People, Paths, and Places, The Frontier History of Moose Pass, Alaska. And this was a community writing project that's really interesting, and I think lots of Alaskans might be interested in this project and people outside of Alaska. Um, we're here as part of the 2022 Alaska Book Week. And what I'd like to do is we have several questions today. Um, and what we'll do is start with introductions. So if each person on today's panel could tell us who you are and what role you played in creating this wonderful book. So let me move this forward for us. Well, we also have lots of pictures from the book that are part of the slides today. So you'll you'll see some, some visual representation of what's going on in the book as well. I'll start. Um, hi, my name is Willow Hetrick. I have lived in Moose Pass since I was four years old. And now I bounce back between Anchorage and Moose Pass as much as I possibly can, try to avoid the big city. And I got involved with this book because I was involved in the previous project, which was creating display panels for the library because my dad wanted display panels for the library. And he said, this would be a great project for you to go after. Here's some funding I think would fit. And we applied for it and got it. And I was kind of the behind the scenes organizer liaison between the designer, Nanette, and the author and editor, Kayleen, helping liaison with the community, digging up photos, getting photo permissions, etc. I want to pass it on to Nanette. Uh, my name is Nanette Stevenson, and um, I was the former art director at Putnam and Philomel Books in New York City for many years. I specialized in children's books, and then I moved to Alaska. I drove myself here, and I have been working closely with Kayleen at Ember Press, the independent book publishing company that she has. And um, we were first involved in a display project at Portage Visitor Center, and Willow saw it, and it was four panels and she said I like that I want that for Moose Pass we have a giant I remember she said we have a big wall let's fill it and uh so I was the designer of the panels and then by extension I was also the book designer on the Moose Pass book among other books that we've done and I'm continuing to work with Moose Pass I think I'll hand it off to Kayleen Hello, I'm Kayleen Johnson Sullivan. Um, as Nanette mentioned, I'm an independent publisher for Ember Press. And at the time of this project, I also uh, was the executive director for the Kenai Mountains Turnigan Arm National Heritage Area, which helped fund the project. Um, so, so it just all came together as, as a community project, uh, starting really with, um, with Willow, these panels in Portage that were at the Portage Visitor Center saying, I'd really like to see this in our lot new library that's being built. Um, and when we had a grand opening for the library and the, I mean, a, a celebration of the panels at the new library, what we heard over and over as people were looking at these uh, historic photos and looking at the text under each one was, wow, we wish we could take this home with us. We wish we could had a book that we could actually have in our hands to to take home because there were a lot of people photos and a lot of people were trying to identify and recognize each other and everyone that we talked to just a loved it and b kind of wished that they could take it home with them so that was the idea of well let's turn it into a book the other thing that would happen in the making of the panels was that there were so much more material that could possibly be put on the panels. And so with the possibility of a book, a book, we could put more pictures and more information in um, in that that document. So yeah, so uh, with that, um, I'll pass it on to Roger. Uh, 
Uh, Roger, you need to hit unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, my name is Roger Painter and I'm a lifelong Alaskan. I was born in Seward, uh, right next to Moose Pass. I got involved with this uh, initially um, when the library was, uh, new library was being uh, built. Um, defending the wall that uh, Willow's panels will go up on. Uh, everyone had ideas for it and I knew I had to keep it clear. Uh, once the panels uh, got installed in the library, I got uh, very interesting in following up and I got a grant from the Seward Community Foundation to make uh, two videos. Those videos are available on the library website and uh, also got a grant from uh, the Kenai Mountain Turnigan Arm uh, uh, Historical uh, Society um, to do some follow-up history work uh, under the library and uh, the library now has an active uh, history group uh, and I no longer live in Moose Pass, I'm in Juneau now. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so the next thing I that I think Willow touched on this a little bit and, and Roger as well, but I thought it would be helpful for people to kind of learn a little bit about how the genesis of this book like how did how did you even come up with this idea of let's write a book about moose pass i'll start yeah thanks jennifer for the question nanette also touched on it and i truly went to the portage glacier visitor center and saw the panels that were created for the history of that Portage Valley area and K KMTA in general, which is Kenai Mountain Turnigan Arm National Heritage Area. And we say KMTA for short. And I, I saw them and I thought they were beautiful. And at the time I was interested in KMTA. I'm now a board member for that organization, but I thought for consistency throughout the region, why recreate the wheel? If we're going to KMTA for funding, we being the Moose Pass community, and KMTA has already funded a very similar project, it would be good for the brand, for the whole KMTA area, to have the same style and the same look. And plus, I just thought they were beautiful. And so I you know, I downloaded all the files and, and I started thinking it would be really great to to make this in Moose Pass. Now, the, at the time, the library was, had just been moved from this little tiny room in the back of the community hall in Moose Pass to the front of the house where we used to keep our, our, our volunteer fire department. Volunteer fire department got a new separate building and they converted the whole front of that, the whole volunteer fire department area, which was essentially a garage into the library. It's beautiful, it's state of the art, but there was one really, really long wall that didn't have anything on it. And I just knew that these panels belonged there. So we had um, an introduction and then we had people, paths and places, which are the same titles as the, the, the panels that are in Portage. But then we started uh, getting so many great pictures and stories from individuals from all the projects like Roger talked about and just being around the community and chatting with people that we added another panel which is called growing up and it's pictures of our elders today when they were youth in Moose Pass which are just really really fun to look at. So to start the development of the content for those all of the panels I just picked areas that I had heard about when I was a kid. 
And I picked people that I heard about when I was a kid and paths that I heard about when I was a kid. But what was really fun and very crucial to this project was community involvement. And at every step of the way, we asked people who should be on the people panel. Where do you, what places do you think should be involved? And we came up with this list and the list was comprehensive. And Kayleen touched on the difference between the information in the panels and the book, which was a logical next step. But we actually gave that list to the elementary school, well, elementary and middle school teacher at the time in Moose Pass, which has a K through eight school. So kindergarten through eighth grade. And we gave her that list and she, was willing to incorporate our project into her curriculum, which was very exciting. And so actually the school children uh, that you can see in one of the front pages of the book, they were the ones that developed the initial content for uh, mostly the people panel, but some of the paths and places. We really wanted them to do the research. We wanted them to be involved. We wanted them to be proud of the product. And that was a really exciting opportunity, I think, for both KMTA as the funder, Moose Pass, you know, elders getting the kids excited to, to learn about the history. And it was also very exciting for the school children as well. And then through interviews and research and text, all of us kind of filled in gaps in, in what we wanted in, in the panels. Is there anything else anyone wants to say about the genesis of the book? I, I, I would add that um, Willow came across some old uh, newspapers, uh, the Moose Pass Miner, and that provided a great deal of information about Moose Pass back in the 1930s. And um, it was a great help, uh, and uh, initially we had just a few uh, copies of the newspaper, but Willow was able later on to get a full copy of all the papers that were published, and those are also available on uh, the in a book form and uh, on the website, you could also read them. Um, I, when uh, Willow and I first spoke about the panels, as she said, there was sort of an overview panel and then the three people paths and places. But one of the things that she had done was online on the library site. And Willow, you can correct me as to what it's called. You had put together all these pictures. I mean, just they're all up there and you can click on them. And as I was pouring through, trying to find the right ones and which ones to put in for the four panels, I just kept coming across these ch the kids, you know, holding the fish, the cat sniffing the fish. I was just so enchanted with them that um, I made that fourth panel, that it's kind of technically the fifth panel, um, and just threw it together one night. And so it didn't have as much of the text for the panels. It, we just identified the people. But when we went to do the manuscript and Kayleen, I guess you want to speak a little bit about your partnership with Willow of how it got written and whatnot, um, the book part, um, you know, that got flushed out and was very exciting to see uh, learning more, who were all the kids on the staff, who were all, you know, and trying to balance out because there were some that there were a lot of pictures of, and then we were trying to get other people. And I don't think we identified the last people in, on the steps of the school until quite recently, there were some unknowns in there, but I think now we have every single one. So, um, and, and it was, it really was fun to see when we were sitting there with the panels and watch the neighbors come in and go, oh, who is that in the bathing suit? And who's, that? oh, I remember. And I think that really was part of the germination of the book. And then also incorporating more of the Moose Pass Minor, uh, Willow, that you worked so hard to have all that scanned and reproduced. And um, that's a huge part of the book, I would say, adding those elements to it. Kayleen? You're on mute, I think. 
Yeah, I just want to mention that the Moose Pass Miner is their excerpts from this newspaper um, and the story about the editor of that newspaper in the book. And they are set aside as sidebars um, with actual excerpts from this newspaper, which are really fun and delightful and very informative in terms of the, the lifestyle of what of this time period. Um, I thought I would also add that the kids who wrote the text, um, they did a great job, but we had, um, but just to be on the safe side, we did have a historian and another person integral to the project, which was, um, who was Rolf Buzzle. He's a historian and he's a wonderful fact checker because he has such a depth of knowledge of this whole area. So we, um, we had a few, few kiddos who were in, in trying to, um, um, make their assignment interesting, took some liberties with um, with what happened on the resurrection trail at one time or another. And I was scrambling to find some of the um, documents because gee, I hadn't heard that before. And it turns out that actually, um, yeah, that was a little bit of a liberty that was taken. So there were some, just some amusing, you know, parts of this whole project that were a lot of fun. Reading the Moose Pass Minor um, and deciding which ex would come um, you know come into play on the book it's a slim book I mean it could have been so much bigger but it was um but we still had some constraints on you know time and on um on the size and the expense so um so I just yeah I wanted to give a nod to Rolf Buzzle and um also the kids we interviewed the kids after the project um was done and it was really fun to hear what their perceptions were of who they had and the people and the places that they had written about. So that was really delightful. I mean, this truly was a community project right from kindergartners on up, from kindergartners to the old timers, the whole community was involved and just made, made it such a pleasure um, to see how everyone worked together to bring the stories of an interesting community together into a book. First the panels and then into the book. Willow kept going back because there were some things that we were very limited on, like pictures of the school versus, you know, and you kept going back and back and people were pulling out shoe boxes, it seemed, and you were really tenacious in terms of trying to hunt down different pictures that we kept coming up with or needed. Yeah, yeah and, and I think at first, uh, with the panels, you know, I swoop in and I'd ask for photos and folks were not really sure they were nervous about sent giving me their photos and then getting them sent away and having them scanned and sent back but after I proved to them that I would indeed return their photos and then they saw the panels that's when the information really started flowing and some families have actually given us the collection, their collections to keep in perpetuity. And we've been on the side from different funding sources, getting uh, archival material and organizing everything so that we can have these gems live on. Yeah, and I, I'll also make a nod uh, and mention too that this photo that is up now, this these school children on the, on the steps, um, originally that photo had all kinds of writing on, on over the top some of them were identifying the, the students themselves and some were not identified and in any case I just want to just let you know how much work went into each of the photos that are in the book um, Nanette just did a beautiful job in designing the book and then making sure that the photos were so so good and um, I just have to say that because I look at this photo and think about what it looked like at the original and it's just amazing so yeah, just um, we point. partnered with um, a man in Ohio, Steve Orff, and as Willow said, people are reluctant to share things and send them away. But instead of just snapping pictures, and sometimes we did have to, we got them scanned, retouching, working on the pictures, and and then the printing and everything. It really, um, it did come out very well, I think. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of moved on to talking more about the process of writing the book. Um, are there any other details of that process that people would like to share? I, I mean, what's amazing is we see this, this beautiful little book, but 
but anyone who's ever worked on creating a book knows that so many things happen behind the scenes <laughs> to get to that point. So, um, so I was wondering if there were other things you'd like to talk about in, in terms of the process of the book. Well, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so we had what we had were a whole lot of parts and pieces and the project, um, we had photos, we had captions, um, some extended captions, and then we had additional photos and then we had uh, a lot of historical documents to draw from. And one of the uh, most interesting being the Moose Pass Miner, which uh, Willow was able to collect and put together in one large document that's been digitized now. If, I, if, I, if, that, if I'm correct, Willow, you can let me know. But um, so, so really the process was more one of cur curating the information we already had. And, um, and then finding ways to edit and make it feel seamless within the book itself. Um, Willow wrote a wonderful introduction to the book, um, a prologue, I guess, an, an introduction. There's a prologue and an introduction that talks a little bit about the kids. Um, and then the format of the book itself follows the formats of the panels. So there's a section about people, a section about paths, a section about places. And then as Nanette said, there was the um, section about kids, children. And um, it's, it's, got, it's very rich in photos. And then we used the panel text as the basis for expanding and um, writing more. And then interspersed throughout the book um, are these excerpts from the Moose Pass Minor, which um, again, were just delightful. A couple of things that are additional to the book uh, that weren't in the panels was uh, profiles of various personalities in the community. So um, for example, Nellie Neal Lawing, she's uh, profiled in the book at, at more length, um, as well as the editor of the Moose Pass Minor, another number of other um, prominent personalities in the community. So it was really a matter of pulling together what we had writing to fill in the gaps and then adding things um, as appropriate. That would be, I, yeah. Kayleen touched a little bit on the, the photos and I think that was one of the things that was most surprising to me about the process because we had photos that were given to us from community members. Those are easy. They said, yes, please use these. And we sent those away to a gentleman. His name was Steve. His name is Steve Orff. And he digitized all of the photos and then made them print quality. So you can imagine if you start with like a one by one inch little photo to be able to blow it up to either be on the panel or included in this book in high quality version takes a lot of time. But then separate from the photos that were given to us from community members, we found photos in the archives. So University of Alaska Anchorage archives, um, Resurrection Bay Historical Society, Seward, I'm gonna blank on their name now, um, Seward Historical Society. And those are available online. You can search for those. And so I just was would Google Moose Pass and I'd, I'd find all these photos. Oh, the um, Anchorage Museum as well. And every single entity that you want to get a photo from to reproduce requires their own form to be filled out, their own payment if they require the payment. And organizing that for 50 photos was quite the task and a lot of back and forth with, with those groups. But, you know, in the end, everyone's working for a common goal. They just have costs associated with maintaining those photos, which is totally understood. So that was uh, surprising to me. I learned the hard way in the panel process. And then what was interesting is when we got the panel, when we got approval for the panel photos, photo use, it was a one-time use agreement. You could use it for the panels. And so we actually had to do it all over again for the book. Uh, luckily I had a lot of the forms saved. So that was pretty easy. I just changed the title. But I don't, I don't know, I should have counted how many photos are in that book, but that took quite, quite some time. And luckily we had planned for that cost, but one suggestion, which I know we're going to get to later is 
you know, when you're, when you want to go about this for yourself, just, just uh, include some money for photo reproduction. And permissions. Yes. And permissions, yes. Right. Cause Steve did the reproduction and then the permissions and the photo credits. Um, I, because one of the things in putting together the manuscript and people don't always think about it. I, we credited every picture in the book. And that that's really important to get that accurate for various reasons and um, follow up on that. Um, and, you know, one I keep thinking one of the things that um, determined this, we had a quote, so we got a very careful quote from the printer, what this book was going to look like, and we chose 96 pages. And as a result, we ended up having to take some things out that just did not fit in there. We added things, we have poetry in there. Um, there were other elements, especially towards the back. The beginning really follows the panels, but as we got further back, more about the school. Um, we wanted to put in the list of the first books at the library and that we couldn't write, we had to take that one out. Um, we, cause Kayleen was, you know, this is what we quoted on, this is what we're, and we did. And you know, if you have to work to that length, you do work to that length. And, and the other thing, I might add, I, I guess in writing this, but writing is copy editing. And I think everyone is surprised at how complicated and exhaustive it is. Joe S. Zuko is our copy editor. She is extraordinary. She actually lived in Moose Pass. When I was telling her about this project, she said, I said, it's this little town. It's here. She said, oh, I know it. I live there. And so she, and we would set the type. I would do it as a book designer, put it in type. She then checked it, then there's proofreading um, and contents page and making sure that everything is um, correct, both fact checking and copy editing, spelling, all of that. So that's another part of putting this book together. And we just kept going through. And then there was also, I don't know if that would come up now, but community review, we made PDFs and uh, you shared it with the community. And that, that was a fairly, in terms of the schedule, a fairly good chunk of time, right, Willow? And yeah, we did give community members several months, and you know we have some local historians that we love to lean on, and and we gave them quite some time to provide their input or provide different photos or have us change the story and just generally give us approval, which was really important to me in particular because. Uh, I think it's really easy to work in a silo. And when you are part of a small community, it's also very easy to upset people very quickly. And so we really wanted to cover all of our bases, involve anyone who uh, wanted to be involved as much as we possibly could. And actually, uh, before I forget, you know, Kayleen was talking about writing the book. We actually have a um, longtime writer in our community, Miss Nancy Erickson, and she was able to help us with some content and actually authored one of the sections. So um, that was really, that was really neat. And it would be nice in the future if we do a second publication, if more people wish to tell their stories, I've been trying to encourage some other individuals to write some things down, um, but they were crucial in not only developing content, but providing a final review on on the text to make sure it just aligned with what they remember. I think Kayleen, you ran into memory. Wasn't there something about a distance? It was on that, I don't know, it was, it was places on the curve or something. Anyway, I remember you were going back and forth and back and forth trying to, because people's memories varied as to what the history of. It was, um, it had to do with the moose, the military road, the moose, the um, and where that actually was on a map was a really hard thing to actually dis discern because there were numerous documents that called it the the military road, but it was, um, it 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 was it took place in different locations depending on this time of the year and the weather conditions and the road conditions. So anyway, it, but it was yeah, it was a lot of sleuthing. There was a lot of um, investigation and trying to check and double check things so yeah it was it was a lot of fun really to, to just go back and forth even things that were in the moose pass minor it was like oh well when did that happen and even in the context of history i mean the moose pass place just as world war ii was starting and so there were some references in um in the about what was happening in the world at the time so 
very, yeah, it was just a really interesting project to, um, and one that, that involved so many people in the community. And Willow did a phenomenal job pulling all of that together. I mean, she was the engine as far as just being out there, being in the community and making um, attempts and getting information. And, you know, she was just amazing. So yeah, it was truly a, jo a joint effort. Yeah, in many ways. So I think um, it, it might be, this might be a good segue moving on to how you made these choices about what to include. So 96 pages is pretty small for a, a book. And um, I, you know, I can imagine once you start like looking into in individual people and places and um, like locations and or pathways in the community, <laughs> people people might be offended if they're not included, or they they um, might think something else is important. So, how did you make those decisions about what to include in the book? I I feel like that would be really hard in a small community. Yeah, it was it was a little difficult. We we did let the school children decide about what they, who and what path or place they wanted to write about. So a lot of the content came from them. That was pretty easy. If we had content, we included it. But the list that we had developed was um, people, paths, and places that everyone was familiar with. You have up here on the screen, Nellie Lawn. She's known worldwide. Um, other hunters, big game hunters, and other prominent community members. Those were really easy picks. And what we tried to somewhat do was put like a, a year range on it, right? A lot of these people that you see, you know, they're not my elders. Those are people who passed long before my parents were born, right? So, um, what we kind of thought we put, we put like, like I said, a year range on it. And we just said, we want to really focus on, I can't even call it prehistory, but like pre my generation of knowledge, capture that because those are, you know, my elders right now remember these people and they are passing away. Um, you know, since we've written this book, two people that I've interviewed have passed. So we really wanted to focus on that early time frame get information that we could out of the out of the current elders so that we had a lot of content and then you know I think we have big dreams of a second publication that has folks that I remember my elders that were kids in these photos and that's kind of, that's kind of how we summarized it we didn't have like a year start and a year end kind of just had a general generation and that's how we included uh, people in the books. I mean, moving forward, there's so many people in the community who could be included in a second publication, Jack Taylor, um, you know, the Condit family, and also the Condit family. Um, and of course, the new generation of the Estes family, they've, they've obviously been in the community for a really long time. So it did stem some ideas and some future content that we'll talk about a little bit later, how we're using that additional content that we received. One of the things, uh, one of the videos that we uh, produced focused uh, right on uh, collecting the memories of uh, the elderly residents in the community. And uh, the people we interviewed, uh, all those names were vetted with the community on uh, our local uh, online uh, newspaper, the uh, Moose Pass Messenger. Uh, so we got broad agreement uh, and uh, some of those memories that Willow was talking about are captured um, on that uh, hour and 15 minute video that's uh, again accessible on the library website.
All right, so I think um, I'd like to move on to this next topic. So we've talked a lot about how the book came to be and uh, some things about the process that you went through in creating the book, but I'm also interested in the kind of reception or the, like how people have seen the book as important, especially in the Moose Pass community. But we can also think about this more broadly as in terms of Alaska as a state or even um, it, for other places or people coming through Moose Pass. I got uh, real interested in um, all the different parts of our uh, history puzzle as a way of uh, uh, building up the community's image. Um, you know, Moose Pass uh, uh, has been a place people pass through and hardly ever stop. And uh, we'd like to get people to stop and get more interested in the community. Uh, there is another project underway that uh, Willow might explain a little bit, a walking tour of Moose Pass. Um, Willow, you want to explain what's happening there? Yeah, definitely. And I will just reiterate what Roger said. You know, people, when you say, oh, I'm from Moose Pass, they go, oh, yeah, that's where you have to slow down on your way to Seward. Like, well, yeah, it is. But it's so much more than that. It's a really important community. And, you know, it was there before Seward was there. <laughs> We've been there longer. And actually, our library is one of the oldest. It, it actually is the oldest registered library in the state of Alaska. Now, there might have been other libraries that were unregistered. So we have a lot of history and everyone that lives in Moose Pass lives there for a reason. We love to be there. We love the history of the area. And one of the things that I think it's been really exciting is we've sold copies of the book either through the library directly or through Ember Press and people are putting it in their Airbnbs, they have it in the lodge, they have it in the store and it just gives uh, an excuse to people to stay there longer and really rather than think of it as a speed trap think, oh gosh, you know, there's kids that live here and they have a lot of history. Slow down a little bit and take a look at the old buildings and connect what you're reading in the book to the community. And you know, Roger talked about the walking tour. That's that's one of the goals is to keep people in Moose Path longer, um, bolster our economic opportunity as much as we possibly can. And we're actually taking the information with this same team here that you see on the screen, we're taking the information that was either in the panels or in the book and expanding on it where we can. Knowing full well that not every single person in this world can afford to buy the book, which is fine. Um, we're doing a historical walking tour of the community. And so we're targeting all those places and combining it with paths and people information as we can. We started with the library. We are moving on to the community hall and next will be the Moose Pass Methodist Church. And, and like everyone has said, there's so much information that we couldn't include in an inch on a panel or 96 pages in a book. This historical walking tour is providing us another, another venue to get more information about the town out to the masses. And just chunking away at the historical walking tour, doing about one to two signs per year um, until we're done. And then we'll see what's next after that. Any other thoughts on the importance of the, the book before we move on? I would, I would just add that um, the panels uh, in the library are very striking. And uh, all visitors are, are attracted to them. Uh, one day at the uh, Solstice Festival, uh, uh, right after we got the panels put up, um, we we're having an open house, and um, 
executive director of the Rasmussen Foundation was in line getting some food and I, Diane Kaplan and I grabbed a hold of her and uh, took her over to the library and she was real impressed. And uh, when she was done uh, taking a look at it, she says, you need to ask us for money. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, that kind of ties into your next slide, Jennifer, about future directions. Um, we talked a little bit about the historical walking tour and where we're going with that. And we're really excited for that to display more photos that didn't make the cut and more information that didn't make the cuts. Um, we really want the community center slash library to be a safe and fun place for people to come and visit. And then we're also in very early communications about taking the Moose Pass Minor and making it into a book again. So that was a little bit dramatic, I suppose, in retrospect, but I knew there was the Moose Pass Minor. I had been given a, a um, partial copy of some of the articles that were produced out of the minor. And I searched everywhere, high and low. I asked everyone around the community. I was in the archives at, at UAA digging for those newspaper copies. And we had some funding that I wanna talk about a little bit later, all of our funding sources. But we had some funding to put the, make the minor into a book. And I searched and searched and searched for easily a year at least to try to get additional issues of the Moose Pass Minor. And finally, I said, well, I've already extended this grant. Time's running out. We just need to do it. And so we made a book of, of what we had of the Moose Pass Minor at the time. No short of a month later, I was finally given the full copy of the Moose Pass Minor from a woman in town, Miss Marcia Shea, who had been gifted uh, the full the full publication um, from one of the elders and she had forgot about it and found it as she was cleaning out her house and oh I you know I heard you were looking for this I thought oh my gosh so since then we have worked with the Alaska G digital newspaper collection they have digitized the entire Moose Pass Minor uh, as part of one of the grants that they received and that was another little side story but they um with those digital copies we would really like to make a full publication of the book so that you can read every single issue it's not missing a single one and um, and so that's really exciting you can kind of read throughout the i think it's about four years of of newspaper that you can uh, read sequentially which is really interesting you start to get to know the people get to know the stories i mean like kayleen said she reported on worldwide news, but she also reported on when someone drove over from Cooper Landing to spend the night. I mean, it's pretty detailed newspaper. There was graphics and, and really cute. So I'll just divest a little bit to the Alaska Digital Newspaper Collection. When I was trying to find copies of the miner, I stumbled across their website. And I thought, oh, dang, this is really nice. So I reached out to the woman and she, you know, we talked for a little while and I've when I finally got the full copy of the minor, I reached back out to her and I said, gosh, I've got the full copy and Moose Pass. We'd love to be a dot on your map. You know, we're never a dot on anyone's map. And by golly, this would be really cool. She said, oh, I don't really have funding at this time. A few months go by and she writes back and she said, I do have funding. One of my other papers dropped out and I'd love, since you have the full collection, to, to work with you to do that. And so we did. Now we're a little dot on the map and everyone can read every single issue of our newspaper. So, um, you know, it's just good to keep those connections and and try. You just never know what, what could happen. Um, I'd also like to just uh, just jump in and just say, you know, that it's in terms of the importance of the book um, to the people of Moose Pass, you know, this is a preservation of of history. And as these elders are passing on, you know, Willow was able to find all of those, uh, you know, the document in somebody's, you know, collection of the Moose Pass Minor. But before that, she couldn't find it anywhere. It wasn't preserved. 
you know, it wasn't anywhere that could, was accessible. And so when she was able to get the full range, you know, now it's being digitized and it's available. Well, the book, anytime we um, bring these things and put them in a book, put them into archives, put them into videos, um, now they're there for forever. And it's just a, yeah, it's just a really gratifying thing to see the history not only come to life, but be preserved in a way that's good for children and our grandchildren to know. I'd just add that the, the Moose Pass Minor uh, was generally an eight page uh, mimeograph uh, uh, newspaper and it contained recipes and poetry. Uh, the editor was real, a uh, real fan of the uh, British uh, royalty, and there was always articles about the Queen and what's going on. She wrote, uh, 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 she was also uh, a fan of uh, the New Deal and uh, obviously uh, leaning towards the Democrat. But I had a lot of national news. Uh, uh, one time she got in a big squabble with the Anchorage Times over uh, a Moose Pass uh, related, uh, well, it was about where the uh, train should be headquartered. And uh, that battle lasted, I think, for a year or so. At any rate, it was a uh, real wonderful reading. And like uh, uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, she also wrote about people coming from Cooper Landing for their visit. So very, uh, very informative and fun to read. Yeah. It, was, it was, it was amazing. <laughs> Is the sound kind of funnier? Um, I wanted to give a quick shout out back to Kayleen and Ember Press because when she was the executive director of the Kenai Mountain Turnigan Arm Heritage here in um, Alaska, she really started making books with Ember Press and preserving the history. And then when Willow came to make this book, there was a whole infrastructure, a knowledge how do you get all the bits and pieces that go in, the barcodes, the, the Library of Congress, which, I mean, this book, when librarians see it, they go, this is a professionally produced book. And um, it's very hard to create an independent publisher and have all the things that go with it, deli even delivery in a snowstorm. And so I, I think that was an element that we were very fortunate to have in creating this book because it could move quickly. We didn't have to go out and find a publisher and people can create books nowadays themselves, you know, but I think the level of quality and the writing and the pictures was really reflected through that knowledge. So I just, I, I think that was part of what we were very lucky to have. Yeah, thank you, Minute. So we're, we're getting short on time. So I wanna make sure we have a chance to talk about this last slide. Um, and what advice would you give for other communities? I, you know, I find this project so inspiring. I love it when like kids are involved and elders are involved and you get, you have expert historians and, and all sorts of members of the community included in this project. So, so what, if another community elsewhere in Alaska or, or outside of Alaska is interested in creating a book like this, um, what advice would you give to them? I would uh, advise having Willow on their team. <laughs> I was gonna say the same thing actually, Roger. <laughs> um, someone who is, is, can shepherd the project, who's passionate about it, um, and who is organized and able to, you know, go after what's needed um, to pull all of the pieces and parts together. Um, yeah, Willa was, was just amazing. And as well as um, then a professional publishing team, um, 
like Nanette said, there are lots of options out there now for publishing, and um, that takes a whole other level of research to to do to do it well. But um, but those are a couple of things, and I and I think the other piece of advice I would give is to make sure that you have your photos, your credits, and your permissions absolutely in order. Um, there were some bumps in the road because um, because of that. So you know, even if families offer photos, you have to have something, you know, some backup in terms of where they actually came from. So that would be my one bit of advice without going in detail as to, you know, some of the bumps in the roads we had, road we had. You know, I think in terms of making books, it's an exciting time, um, you know, from I'm a traditional book designer. Uh, and um, that's one way of putting a book together of working with somebody like that. But nowadays, you know, with print on demand, with all these different programs that you can go in and click and put in copy, um, you know, and depending on what the community wants, uh, there's a lot of different choices in terms of how you manufacture the books. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I'm going to go back to emphasizing that that the text and what you printing in it is carefully vetted. And I think Kayleen's touching on that because once it becomes a physical book, it's very hard, you know, print on demand, you could go back and fix the files. But um, if you take delivery of a book, you've got that book. And so I, I think that's the, and you don't want to upset somebody. They're holding the book and they go, oh goodness, that's not true. So I think that, you know, that's where the team and Willow and her knowledge it was so important and the, all that work up front um, and being clear and communicating. And, and hopefully it's it's a fun project for a community. It's people that want to do it, that they're, they have the time. There is maybe a historical society that they can team with, um, that it's a group. And I think, uh, and be patient. I think that that's important as well. And somebody who's really organized, I think those are all elements of it. Yeah, I would say patience and fun, have a lot of patience and have a lot of fun and know that it takes a long time to get this information out and just the communication with your constituents is the best you can do. Uh, I did want to just have some advice for other communities. You know, these are these are high ticket, high dollar items that we've been producing. And I want to just talk about funding real quick and what kind of funding we've been going after to piece these pro projects together. We've mentioned a lot the Kenai Mountain Turnigan Arm National Heritage Area. They are arguably our number one funder. And we're very lucky to be in a heritage area. Not many communities can say that. There's only one in Alaska. Um, so I feel very, very fortunate to be connected to that organization. The Seward Community Foundation has been a great funder of all of our projects, namely the videos that we were able to put together. And we've also been utilizing money from the Kenai Peninsula Borough Capital Assistance Sharing Program that they have with all of their unorganized communities in the borough. They sh it's a revenue sharing program. And luckily my mom's the one that's in charge of the money for revenue sharing from the borough. And so it's pretty easy for her to slide a couple thousand dollars onto me every single year to continue or um, you know, work, work on some things. We've also been lucky to have private funders who are very interested in this, give, give the library money to work on that. Um, we have three nonprofit organizations in the community, which is very unique, and we try to use all three of them for different reasons. We have the Moose Pass Chamber of Commerce, who is the one that receives the Kenai P Peninsula Borough revenue sharing money. We have the sewer community, I'm sorry, the Moose Pass Library and they receive most of the KMTA funding. And then we have the Moose Pass Sportsman's Club, which has been instrumental in getting us uh, Rasmussen funding as well to work on these issues. So I would say just get creative, look out there for small grants, have a plan together and really show your grantors that you can you know, do the work and, and how they all fit together. What grantors really like is cost sharing and sharing with other organizations. And if you can highlight that to them, I think you'd have a home run. Roger, did I miss any funding sources? I really wanted to touch on, on all of those. So I said KMTA, 
the borough, Seward Community Foundation, Rasmussen. And I think that's, those have been our major funders. That's, that's about it. For the videos, we had a couple of local residents uh, right. donate money as well. Well, we're just about out of time. So I wanna make sure that people know how to learn more about this project. Um, so there's a QR code here. If you hold up your phone and with the camera on you, it'll take you to the library's page that has um, information about the book. It has the panels. It has uh, amazing photographs that aren't even in the book um, to look at and learn more about the the um, People, Paths, and Places project. And I just want to say thank you so much to Willow and Kayleen and Roger and Nanette for joining me today for this conversation. This is such an inspiring project and I really hope other communities will um, try to do even just a tiny bit of this sort of work in their, their own local place. Yeah, and thank you too for uh, to the Alaska Center for the book for um, for hosting our uh, discussion today and um, for the whole um, Alaska Book Week that is a celebration of Alaska books. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Yes, I, I would just add, yes, thank you, Jennifer. This has been lovely. It's lovely to bring the team back together. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the Moose Pass Minor and it started on little mimeograph sheets, and it really is the ancestor of all of this in many ways. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't, you know, I think the idea is to come together and tell stories. And I think stories are important to people. Mm -hmm. And um, as we preserve these stories, we have a chance to share them. We look at our past and it, it tells us something about what might be our future. So um, thank you.